TheMesh.TV, an online network of original free audio and video shows based out of Western North Carolina, reaching the entire world. Listen and watch through iTunes or through the website TheMesh.TV. Hey everybody, welcome to the RealTailgate.com college football hangout. This is a weekly Google hangout sponsored by Smithfield's Chicken and Barbecue. I'm your host, Big J Waldo. Over there is Ben Swain. Some people call him the gangster of love. He's our producer. And Talking Moose Media has our back on the technical side. You can join us here every Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. as Ben, myself, and a rotating set of panelists discuss college football in North Carolina. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Smithfield Chicken and Barbecue. And they want me to remind you, it's just not a tailgate without the barbecue. Log on to realtailgate.com for special offers, a list of locations, archived editions of this hangout, and you can download the realtailgate.com college football podcast. Uh, the guest this week is going to be Ruffin McNeil, Coach McNeil from East Carolina, so it should be a good show. This week, our guests are, of course, Ben Swain, the ever-lovely from the walk-ons, we welcome back J.P. Mundy from SB Nation's blogger So Dear. We have James, the king of the quaff curl from RiddickandReynolds.com. We also have our welcoming back Lauren, keep it on the brown low, yeah. from Fox Sports Carolinas. And welcome back to Mike Maniscalco, host of the morning show on 99.9 .9 The Fan and 6.20 a.m. The Buzz. How's everybody doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. <laughs> oh, I didn't well, know we had been transported to the islands. Jamaican flair, okay. <laughs> Is that French-Canadian? <laughs> I, I don't know what I am. I'm so happy that college football's back in session, though. I don't Do know I about need... college, but college football, yes. Do I need to bust out with my Italian Willis Springs accent? Uh, <laughs> sure, let's hear it. Well, as you can see, uh, we have uh, the tower. Oh, wow. Oh. There goes like 8% oh. of our <laughs> well, audience. Yes, All right, please. well, it's been Viewers. fun, guys. Have a really good time on the rest of the podcast here. <laughs> Should I throw out my Twitter address now or at the end? <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay, so. Um, no, it wasn't. Let's let's talk about uh, some football, as opposed to James's horribly offensive accents. Well, uh, offensive. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I apologize just, to yeah. my Willis. Mine was ready. far more offensive, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I probably would excel at bobsledding. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> so. The games, the games, the games. Feel the rhythm. Feel the rhyme. Get out up, Waldo. It's bobsled time. I, I'm just saying I'm good ballast, that's all. You're the anchor. That's that's right. You just put me up in the front, and I will drag that sucker down the hill. <laughs> um, yeah, so, Sadie, kick, state wins. Yes. Still is that how you say his name? I, I never actually knew yes. how to say his name. It's Sadie, yep. Yes. Smooth operator. Yeah. Shot a is not correct. I mean, let's. we can put this one to James, but this is one of those games, guys, where a win doesn't feel like a win for NC State because they're supposed to win this. That's why you play 1AA teams. And Richmond's good, and, and they're very well coached with Danny Rocco. But, I mean, you're trailing this game for the majority of it. It shouldn't have to come down to hitting a 40-yard field goal with less than a minute to go to win a game against a 1AA school in your building. And, I mean, I don't know if this put up more questions or more problems for this team. And guess who's next? Clemson. So, I mean, I, I don't know. You're supposed to make your improvements from week one to week two. You're supposed to get better. You'll see the most drastic improvements. And I saw I saw steps back from the NC State Wolfpack from that game. And, you know, it, it's, it's great that they have that weekend off, but – then you got to go play Clemson on Thursday night, so it's not like they're getting a reward for having a bye week after squeaking that one out. 
Well, I made this argument on this week's podcast that we did uh, that you know if you're gonna you know get your W, you probably want to get it in a fashion that gives you something that you can coach from. And if you're blowing out a team that's you know uh, winning, if you if you win 48 to nothing, 56 to nothing, I don't know that there's a whole lot of film that you can coach from. Uh, Dave Dorn, for better or worse, now has a ton of film that he can coach from, uh, and a lot of things that he can point to and say. You guys almost got beat by one AA team or FCS program. Uh, there's no reason why you should feel like you don't have a ton of improvement that needs to be done still. And, oh, yeah, there's Clemson looming in the uh, in the foreground. So, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, that's a positive way to put a spin on it. Obviously, I think a lot of state fans and even the coaches probably would have preferred to have a much more convincing win. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, it still counts as a W when it comes to uh, the overall record and bowl eligibility, so we'll take it. Yeah, yeah what are we talking about in terms of uh, NC State's ceiling here? I mean, it's not like they were going to go on and win the ACC championship. It's not like they're going to be in the national championship picture. And James said it right. You know, if they get to six wins and get to a, a bowl or you know, six or better wins and get to a good bowl, that's a successful season. So, yeah, it was a tight game. Um, I've, I've heard Richmond is, is hard to beat. I'm not really <laughs> you know, familiar first time with that. But, um, but, no, I think it's absolutely fine that they won uh, in a close game. I, I didn't take anything away from it other than Richmond's better than a lot of people gave him credit for. Um, you know, that last field goal should have never even happened the way that the, the, way that the Spiders managed the clock at the end of the game. Um, so, you know, State got a break and, and, and took it and won, and I think that's a positive. I think you move on. I think just, like, the general derpiness of it was a bit of a concern, at least for me, just watching it, because in week one, I thought State looked pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good. And then week two, it's like they're turning it over anytime they get remotely close to, you know, Richmond's goal line, and then, you know, the defense is committing a bunch of penalties, and a- a- that was a little bit of a concern for me. Not so much the result, but just more that part of it. You would not like to see more mistakes in week two than you did in week one, but that's going to happen throughout the year, so we'll see. Maybe it's just a blip on the radar. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was the the turnovers and, like you said, lowering the penalties, um, and I think those are, you know, for the most part, correctable, coachable, um, you know, Val, uh, Marcus Valdez Gantling. I mean, he's catching the ball, you know, and he's not going to make it into the end zone, but he's you know setting the the squad up for what would probably be a pretty easy score given the way they had marched the ball down the field, and he just coughs it up right into the hands of one of the defenders. And so, yeah, you know, you wonder if you score <laughs> there, does that put more pressure on Richmond, and are they a little tighter? You know, well, that was the first uh, drive or two of the game, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if State scores on that first yeah. drive, you know, suddenly, you know, it's probably uh, a much different feel to that game. It starts off much more like the Louisiana Tech game did than this particular one where, where you know, you give a team like Richmond that's obviously good, capable of beating uh, an FBS program, you know, you give them hope. You give them the opportunity to pull out a win. They're going to do well enough in that situation to where they can. And James, they, they almost did it. James, do you think that NC State should have run more option? I think JP might have some uh, <laughs> yeah. comments on <clears throat> Yes, there was not nearly enough of that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people probably had some uh, thoughts about you know, Pete Thomas's performance. Um, but we're talking about Wake, man. See, we're done talking see, about. Here's, oh, here's, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, if you want to go with this the is general, the Riddick and Reynolds look, podcast. Look, if you want to go with the general, if you want to go with the general problem here, and look, you can say Pete Thomas didn't play well, and there were turnovers and all this. Up front, a Division One school should dominate a Division One AA school, and State didn't do that on either line. That's the concern. And guess what? Now it gets harder. Now you play teams that have legitimate offensive linemen and defensive linemen who are going to be playing on Sunday or they're going to be all ACC. And you can say that's coachable and correctable, but if you can't push Richmond down the field, how are you going to push Clemson or Florida State down the field or Duke or anybody else in this conference for fact of that matter? And I think that's where the concern is. And look, I think Ben said it best. Nobody was sitting here saying that State was going to win the ACC this year, but these are the games where you should get to see the second and third stringers play. 
And in the fourth quarter, yeah, hey, great. Woo, we get to see Pete Thomas in a pressure situation or somebody's going to come in and make a kick. That's great. But it shouldn't happen against Richmond. That's the, the upfront physical play of this team should be a concern for the coaching staff, should be a concern for Matt Canada and Dave Doran, and that's it. And we can walk out, and at the end of the day, you hang your hat, nobody's going to remember at the end of the year if this team goes 8-4 and four, that they squeak one out against Richmond. But if they go 5-7, and seven, this is going to be one of those games where people are going to say, hey, where's the talent for this team for next year? Or they got a, they got a long road of recruiting to make this team better. But if you want to say a win's a win, then fine, a win is a win. But there were enough, at least for me, there were enough question marks for this game to wonder where is this team going to be by the time we get to week six or seven of the of the ACC season. Well, honestly, Mike, I, I don't really care. I mean, you know, we, we could, I mean, short of us, you know, losing out from this point forward in the schedule, I mean, you know, I, and this is just me speaking. It could be completely different for your average NC State fan sitting in the stands, but you know, this is, you know, uh, a completely different offense, a completely different coaching staff, you know, question marks across the field, uh, holes that need to be filled by that red light recruiting, um, you know. I, but they're getting three stars, James. Where are the five <laughs> stars? They're the not five stars. Play they're not going to play, by the way, five stars aren't coming to NC State if they're squeaking out wins over Richmond and then lose out the rest of the year. Right. Let, me, let me try this again, guys. We've got, we got JP on the show, and he's like Michael Campanero because we're not using him at all. <laughs> oh, very nice. Very um, nice. Yeah, I don't. I don't. The state's not the story this weekend. You know, Duke had the injury. That's the only story coming out of that. We still don't know anything about UNC after two games. But Wake is kind of an embarrassment right now. I think that's the story that we need to talk about. Oh, I thought they looked great, personally. Um, <laughs> that, I like the uniforms, JP. I like <laughs> the white on white. That's a good hey, look. I, so. I told you they'd look good on national television. I thought thought they looked great until they actually kicked off. Um, you know, it, it that was. I want four hours back in my life. That was hard to watch. I, I really thought, like Mike was saying earlier, it was week two. You go up to against a very average Boston College team. I thought that they would have some stuff ironed out and be ready to play, and they just came out lethargic. Um, it seemed like everything they did, and you guys who watched it on television, correct me if I'm wrong, but everything just looked like it took forever, especially yep. on offense. I mean, the, their option, when they ran the options, it, it just took forever, and... Sometimes the pitches didn't get all the way there, and yeah, it, it, at no point, even after Campanero's uh, touchdown, at no point was I confident that Wake Forest was going to get back in that game and come back to win it. Yeah, I mean, Wake, uh, or Riley Skinner, I should say, looked completely lost trying to run that offense. Riley Skinner? Riley Skinner? Did I, what did I say? Uh, this, is the se this is the second time I've completely uh, <laughs> substituted a completely... Well, uh, well, it's hey, James, James, that's okay Tanner? if Riley Skinner loses games for Wake because he's not quarterbacking that team anymore. <laughs> right. Tanner okay. Bryce, I think it's it's Tanner? Right. Okay. Skinner. Rusty Tanner. LaRue. Rusty LaRue. Rusty man. LaRue. <laughs> oh, man, that's taking me back. <laughs> Yeah, Tanner Price. Did I get that one right? There you Correct. go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, he he looked. I'm sure Raleigh Skinner can run an option like nobody's business. But Tanner Price looked completely lost uh, running it. And yeah, I don't know. JP, do you think that uh, Go uh, Grove tries to adjust the offense from this point forward, or does he just try to put that square peg in that round hole? What he told us yesterday at his uh, weekly press conference was that he has no intention of you know of junk in the offense but what he's going to do is he's going to try to to slim down the playbook which kind of puzzled me because I only I didn't see a whole <laughs> lot of variation there but he did make one valid point which is he said that you know things might have been a lot different if we, if they were better in, in the, the passing game and I look back at the stats and Tanner was only 18 for 30 or 32 and he you know for the touchdown and he threw a pick and you know he might have a he might have a point there the bulk of Wake Forest opponents are going to come in geared, geared up to stop the run. And so when that happens, they've got to be ready to throw the ball. And so I'm giving them one more week before I start raising up the old white flag. JP, do you think it could be that they fell victim to the the sleepier atmosphere than what they actually play in at Wake? I mean, let's face it. You know, everybody talks about when you go into Wake, it's so friendly, it's so nice. You go up to Boston College, there's nobody there. There's no atmosphere for that game. Which I don't understand because it is the premier rivalry in all of college sports. Yeah, yeah. I circled. I, I mean, when the calendar came out, which one of us didn't circle that game? Ben, Jim Grubb. 
<laughs> well played, sir. The tailgate special from Smithfield's Chicken and Barbecue. It's eight pieces of chicken, a pint of barbecue, any two sides, two dozen hush puppies, and a whole gallon of tea. Just go to realtailgate.com for details, coupons, and a list of locations that open early on game day. Is he pulling a Costanza? Is that possible? Is he trying to get fired? <laughs> I was wondering that myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm really disappointed in Jim. Jim Grove went from being the genius of the ACC to being like battling it out with Mike London for the worst coach in the league. Is that is that possible? Is is that possible that that statement is true? That's crazy. No, I don't think so. Uh, I just I think he's got a bunch of kids that he's not comfortable with right now, and he's not going to say that publicly because they're kids. Um, specifically, I tried to get him yesterday to admit that he didn't like any of his running backs, and uh, of course he wouldn't do it. But... Well, he said that at media day, though, basically. I he mean, said, it, said it was a disaster, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he didn't shy away from it. And, you know, the weird thing to me is, like, they kept saying, oh, this part of the playbook's in pencil, and now he's saying, oh, well, we're not going to scrap this part. We're just going to, what do you say, simplify it or cut it down or whatever? And it's like... Oh man! Like, what is <laughs> what what was uh, going on in the off season here? Maybe you need to throw out throw out the parts that were in pencil. Maybe those it's need team. to be erased. He's got, he's got the longest tenure in the league, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's his team. I don't I think he liked them last year either. So no. you know, I mean, he's got certain kids that he, he that he really likes, but he's got nobody that can block for him. He, you know, one of the guys, Sherman Ragland. One, of the, he's a receiver, very talented, got great hands, but he didn't even make the trip to to Boston because he's one of those guys that's kind of a knothead, hadn't gotten it on and off the field. And, you know, and the problem is Wake needs blockers, and he's the best blocking wide receiver Wake Forest has. Well, and let's also face it, I think the most disappointing thing for Wake is they should have cashed in on that ACC championship by now, and they've regressed. I mean, that was – I was thinking, okay, that's the building block after they won the title. Now they're, it's going to be a little bit easier to recruit to Wake, and, and like you just said, JP, he doesn't like this team, and part of that is – the kids who they brought in, you know, part of that is the coaching staff and the recruiting that they had. But uh, I think that that's we're measuring this Wake Forest team to a team that won the ACC. And I think what we need to look at it is that team was an anomaly. That is not going to happen again at Wake Forest. So if they can just be a six or seven win team, that's what Wake Forest is. And then this year they look like they're going to be taking another step back until they can move forward. I think Wake Forest. Um, what, what I'm finding out, at least my my perspective, is Wake Forest did a whole lot better when they had average to you know a bunch of average athletes with some you know diamonds in the rough sprinkled in like Aaron Curry, Alfonso Smith that were overachieving and kind of changed the culture there, and it, they got in some better athletes and they just the effort wasn't there. There may be a you know maybe there's a sense of entitlement. They were coming to a, a program that was on the upswing. I don't know what it is, but I I think. Grove in this off, this past off season realized that and has started to try and rebuild, but you never know. I'm I'm reminded of uh, the post national title years for Gary Williams. I mean, you know, we all thought Gary Williams would cash in his title yep. and suddenly turn Maryland into a perennial power, and it just didn't happen. And so I don't know. It is are the two situations similar or are they completely different? I mean, I, I don't get the sense that Grove is sleeping on recruiting or, or, you know, just fed up with being a coach, but the results are kind of mirroring one another as far as big title, big win, followed by years of, you know, regression. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen Saturday. I don't know what's going to happen going forward, except I do know one thing. I know that no matter how bad they are, State will still find a way to lose at pb and <laughs> <laughs> It's debt taxes and that. After y'all beat Clemson Saturday. So. <laughs> and that, too. I think we okay, just need to, get Nikita, we, we need to get Nikita Whitlock some goal line carries. That's my goal for the rest of the season. If that happens, I will be so happy. I keep trying to come up with a Lafem Nikita joke for him, and I just can't quite make it work. So I'm gonna, James. I'm just gonna tell you, just pull the ripcord on that one and don't try. <laughs> we retired there, it after there, a Michelle there, Koff graduated. There, there, there are some things that are really good on paper, but you know, to to put them yeah. in motion, it's kind of hard. And uh, but Lauren, I'm with you. Although I I kind of think that Jim Grobe should be ripping out pages of the playbook, and I would have to, that would add more, and then that would that would just add to confusion. Uh, let's go to Duke, shall we, Ben? Should there be any concern that there is a new quarterback in town starting under center, that it will be Brandon Kinnett from here on out, derailing Duke's opportunity to be the Wake Forest of this year's ACC? Not at all. I mean, Brandon Kinnett fits in as an ACC quarterback so well because you've got Brandon, you've got Tanner, you've got Bryn, Chase, 
uh, you know, it's like my, um, you know, my like private school graduating class is basically what it's like. <laughs> so I think you're, he just fits, fits in with a name, right? Uh, you no, know, that hurts. That hurts. I mean, I think the biggest thing, the biggest concern with Duke right now is not so much the drop off from from Boone to Kinnett, but after Kinnett, there's no one, and yep. when you've got a running quarterback. Uh, you know, and, and we've seen in this league that there's uh, not a hesitancy to, to hit guys and, and maybe put them on the sidelines when there's a chance to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's the concern. There's no one, beh- there's no one behind Kinnett. P.S. Kinnett said, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before on a conference call, that he's never slid in his career and he doesn't plan to start now. So, uh, uh-oh. I got bad news. Yeah, State's kind of faced with a, a similar situation. I mean, I'm not saying... It's necessarily the same, but you know, after Pete Thomas, who do we have? We have Bryant Sheriffs, uh, and he's a guy who didn't throw it all in the first game and threw what two, three times in the Richmond game. Three. Uh, he completed yeah. all of them. Yeah, he's three for oh, three. Well, so he's 100. percent So let's just run with him from here on out. Um, well, but I mean, that's but that's everywhere, guys. That's every college football program. Right. When you get down to the second string quarterback as your starter, you're not banking on the third string guy being ready or actually getting real minutes or or valuable minutes for the team, but. Uh, ben, I think the one thing that David Cutcliffe has done wisely over the years is he's found a way to get these guys in and get valuable snaps. I mean, let's face it, Kinnett has taken valuable snaps in games before, and, you know, he was penciled in as a quarterback, and then he became, what, the the everything player for this team. But he's he's used to doing it. So I, I think that I think they'll be fine, and, you know, you, you just got to play who you got. You can't worry if he gets hurt. But, I mean, James, your point is, is dead on. But if you get to the third-string quarterback, I mean, I don't care if, we're talking about Duke or if we're talking about Clemson, you get to the third string quarterback, your team's going to be in trouble. And if you're Alabama, you're getting to a guy who doesn't get any cash for his hotel room or any of that. <laughs> That's unfortunate, but true. <laughs> Unless he went to uh, Oklahoma State and asked for it. Yeah. All right, Ben, I'm tossing you speaking, a segue. Speaking uh, of uh, Oklahoma State, <laughs> while we still have some time left, let's talk about this expose from Sports Illustrated about paying players in cash. There's also the story from Charles Robinson um, about five SEC players receiving cash. Just five. Uh, There's only five. Oh, <laughs> yeah, only five of them. <laughs> yeah, only it's five. a non-story. Including, including one from a championship team. Right? That's so, crazy. Um, also, I guess uh, Fedora was on the Oklahoma State staff. At the time, was he? No. Oh, oh yes, God. he was. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> um, how how dirty is this game getting? I I saw this getting getting. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Lauren, I yield my time on the floor to you after I heard getting. Go right ahead. I mean, I think that kind of says it all. It's not getting dirty. It's been dirty. I mean. I think somebody, I don't remember who said it on Twitter, but somebody said if this UNC story had come out three years, like if it came out today, like how much would we all be shrugging our shoulders? Of course, how much would we all be shrugging our shoulders now? How much are we shrugging our shoulders now because of UNC to begin with? I mean, you know, there is that. But, I mean, yeah, it's it's been dirty. It's going to be dirty. It is what it is. I mean, it's just, it's the reality. I was not, I, was, I haven't been shocked by anything I've read in that story so far. I doubt that they're going to write anything that's going to shock me. Further, I wasn't really shocked by the Yahoo thing, although I thought it was pretty well reported, like people are saying. But yeah, I mean, it's not a shock. And, and by the way, this isn't the first time, maybe this decade, but go back to Colorado. Gary Barnett, that's what got Colorado in all that trouble, where they were having parties when the kids were coming in and hostesses, whatever you wish to call them. <laughs> uh, but they they were they were making sure that the recruits who were coming to Colorado would stay. And then before that. You know, you can you can just run down the list. This is something that, as long as there have been boosters and they want to get kids into a program, uh, I've I've talked to coaches who coached in the '70s and told me that they'd go up against certain coaches and the kids would ask them or the parents would ask them, "So what are you going to do for us?" I mean, it's just the culture of the game. So I, I think the bigger problem is: is there anything that you can do to clean it up? And I honestly, guys, I don't think there's anything you can do because you catch one. But then somebody else will do it. And, and college football is not willing to put big programs on huge probation. I know we saw it with Penn State, but that's a totally different situation we're talking about. It's now about TV dollars, and they want games that, that we all want to sit back and watch. And I think that there's, there's no way of getting the horse back in the barn. 
So what, what tells me that college football is dirty is that you've got guys like Tyler Bray and and uh, and Greg Little who are getting cash money to play college football. Hey, those back tats don't pay for themselves. Guys. <laughs> I mean, if those guys are getting paid, I just, you know. But, you know, with, with Fedora at, at Oklahoma State, do you think he was creating some plausible deniability by kicking off twice in the game uh, on Saturday? <laughs> no, I think, that would, I think that would just indict him further, don't you? <laughs> what are you saying? He doesn't, not, he doesn't know what's going on inside of his program. That makes perfect sense, right? Like heads or tails, he can't make a call. <laughs> Who kicked twice? <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised to learn that DJ Fluker's middle name was Jesus. Uh, so <laughs> that well, that, you know, I'm glad you brought him up, James. And the most shocking thing in all of this is that he probably wasn't hacked on Twitter when when he mentioned getting paid earlier right. this year. Yeah. Oh, right. that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, is the difference now that we have a Charles Robinson, uh, a Rand Getlin versus I mean, in the past, I mean, we've always had investigative journalism, but I don't know. You have uh, a unit like Yahoo Sports and their investigative unit that has honestly, you know, blown up in a lot of things. We know about obviously the Reggie Bush thing. They've also looked into a lot of other scandals. That seems to be their calling card. Is you know, if Charles Robinson shows up on your campus, you know, you're not happy. Uh, you know, is is that the difference? Is that why we're hearing about it now, or is it just simply what we assign all other? Uh, changes in culture is just the internet makes it easier to find, easier to read, easier to access. I think it's all of the above, and it's one of the reasons I think we should, it's it's time for the NCAA or somebody to act and maybe implement something akin to the Olympic model and just start finding a way to to, to compensate the, the these athletes because otherwise these stories are going to co keep coming out. There's going to be more of them, and it's going to get more sorted and more sorted. But I, I don't I, – honestly, JP, I don't think compensating athletes will solve the problem because you're always going to have programs looking for an edge. Just like you have – you know, we always talk about how testing for HGH and steroids in professional sports, you know, some people say, well, that will get it out of the game. Well, no, it won't. You'll just find, you know, a, a clinic that comes with a new drug that's better and that can't be detected because there's always going to be athletes looking for an edge. And in the same vein, you're always going to have boosters – with a, a school that they love that's always going to do whatever they can to find that edge. And, you know, if we paid players a per diem or, or a certain dollar amount, you know, they're always going to tack on more on top of that because, you know, if I can go to Alabama and get, you know, five grand or get some sort they of – They weren't going to uh, go to Alabama anyway. anyway. That's Al the Alabama is a bad – Alabama is a bad example. <laughs> no, I'm, but I'm, James, I'm going to agree with JP just for this reason because if you make compensation part of the game now – you're at least taking out one more rule that'll be violated. So, all right, let them get paid. You know that that's fine, and and that way it's not coming from the university. They can regulate it a little bit more. And you're right, boosters are still going to give the five hundred dollar handshakes. But it's going on now. I mean, it's. I just again, I just want to stop. I just want to stop guys. You know, like Joe DeForest walking around the locker room with uh, envelopes filled with a thousand dollars in cash. That's that's what needs to stop. And, and I maybe don't think if that it's will out, stop maybe, it. but maybe, but maybe if it's out there. It'll stop it a little bit more, or it'll curtail it a little bit more than what's already out there. If the kids know that they're going to get money from the university, does it really need to stop? I mean, who's getting, who's getting are hurt? Are we going to stop watching? <laughs> yeah, that's the, thank you. I mean, it's not like James. It's not like if you found out if NC State paid half their players this year, you're going to stop cheering for NC State, right? I will burn all of my gear in a. All pile. right, that's now on the record. <laughs> wow! So. Please, yeah, that's, that's Charles true. Robinson. Do Don't not pull come a team of Higgins here. But here, so the, 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 yeah. the, the uh, college football. I should have worn that suit. Right I wish I could have and just done the T right. Boone back in the chair an intimate evening with T Boone Pickens. That sounds awful. It, it is <laughs> until until you realize the dinner, then it's all worth it. Did Mark Thomas get paid when he was at state? Absolutely uh, not. I. I don't know. You gotta that's ask Mark. Yes. Much, yes. much like, much that's, like. Uh, no, yes. Once again, as the, you gotta ask Mark. That's we, not, we've never paid anybody from Smithfield. Coach has actually paid me not to show up for their college football <laughs> program. So that's all I know. All right, guys, we're about out of time. Um, let's go around for a little parting shot. Anybody got a very brief statement? Yes. Blurb, if comment, if, if, criticism. <laughs> If NC State loses out and James Curl says he's okay with that, I know I won't be following him on Twitter because I just couldn't take all the tweets. 
<laughs> Lauren? Lauren? Saturdays would be terrible. Well, I just want to say I'm really happy about the fact that there are a lot fewer games in the ACC this weekend, so there are a lot fewer chances for the ACC to have ACC fail. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> hey, Mr. Curl. I will miss you guys next week. I'll be, of course, uh, hosting the uh, wild and crazy pep rally that's going on on NC State's campus. So Where is that? It'll be uh, in the West Campus Amphitheater. So if you're a state fan, know where that's at. First of all, email me where that's at. Uh, and second of all, come on <laughs> down to the, uh, to the show. And uh, it's going to be crazy. Cause what you time? Know me. 7 to 8. 7 to 8. Dave Dorn will be there. Uh, so I'll be uh, – if ever there was a coach that was perfect for me to have a pep rally for, it's Dave Dorn because he's milder than I am. So I'll seem excited by him by comparison. A delicious dish with you two. <laughs> Mr. Mundy. <laughs> I really got nothing except to say that, Swain, that is just a fetching purple shirt you've got this evening. Fetching. It is. Uh, I have to yeah. agree. Uh, and seeing, I was going to say, seeing Ben, shouldn't we end it with the ACC is now 2-2 two and two against the SEC? Shouldn't we be chanting ACC out the door? Uh, I'm just mad that we didn't get a chance to talk soccer tonight, Mike. <laughs> Jurgen Klinsman, he's going to be the difference. Dos acero. Bowl eligible. <laughs> Can he coach the Panthers? That'd be good. All right. Uh, we're out of time, everybody. Thanks very much to all of our guests. Really appreciate you guys taking your time to come on the show. Uh, again, thanks to our sponsor, Smithfield Chicken and Barbecue. Again, reminding you it's just not a tailgate without the barbecue. Make sure you check out, check out uh, realtailgate.com and the college football podcast available there or on themesh.tv or on iTunes. Again, I'm your host, Jay Waldo. For our producer, Ben Swain, uh, good night. We'll see you next week. The tailgate special from Smithfield's Chicken and Barbecue. It's eight pieces of chicken, a pint of barbecue, any two sides, two dozen hush puppies, and a whole gallon of tea. Just go to realtailgate.com for details, coupons, and a list of locations that open early on game day. TV, an online network of original free audio and video shows based out of Western North Carolina, reaching the entire world. Listen and watch through iTunes or through the website, TheMesh.TV.